Right, it is 11 o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Uh, we are going to get going. So welcome to today's session. Um, as always, a bit of housekeeping. We are recording today's session. We will also have a copy of the slides available after today's webinar. Um, so do let us know if you'd like either of those and we'll send those over to you. Uh, your feedback is a gift. So there's a little a quick feedback survey that will launch after this. Um, and please don't forget to join us. There is a final webinar uh, next week in the November series covering the London underground and London-based rail infrastructure, cross rail, cross crossrail one and two. So for those who uh, do any work in and around London and it, the rail infrastructure there is a concern, that is our last one uh, next week. So let's get going. So this is our agenda for today. We're going to start with railways, looking at both current and historic, and then we're going to jump into HS2 and kind of a more in-depth um, look at the data uh, and what we use on our reports and some guidance and next steps. Now, the UK has a very extensive and very old railway system. And whilst, for the most part, of course, railways make our lives very easy and, and much more convenient. It is really good to be aware of where they are as they can potentially impact property value and even property enjoyment, both positively and negatively. Um, personally, myself, I live very close to a busy and active railway station and railway line. Some days I don't hear it. Other days it feels incredibly loud depending on which way the wind blows. And you know, other times it's a real pain because I, ha I, I live actually very close to railway crossing. Uh, and next to a mainline artery road in my town. So sometimes you get stuck 15, 20 minutes just trying to get out of my street um, because it can be that bad in terms of, of tailbacks uh, when the railway crossing is and the barriers are down. So just, you know, there's it can impact everybody in, in various ways. Now, ground sure includes data on all current working railways and some of it you can see here. And denoted in blue and depending on what report you get it may or may not already be included uh, something like a home buyers or an avista report would identify any um, railway if it is within close proximity to the property but we also include um, data on underground networks let's say outside of london so here in red you can see in the map you've got the tynanware metro you've got the glasway uh, glasgow subway and you've got the Man uh, manchester uh, metrolink um, we also include data on all abandoned railways, which is what you see in purple. And as you can see on this map, there's probably a lot more than most people would think or even realize. Now, when purchasing a property, depending on your proximity to either an active railway or historic, historic railway line or stations, it can have a potential impact uh, on whether or not the client may want to purchase a property, particularly um, it's good for people to be aware, particularly if a client's unfamiliar with a local area. Um, the effects of active railways are, of course, very obvious, I would say, to most people. But when we start delving into sort of the more historic side of things, historic railways and tunnels, the understanding of why it's good to know about these things is certainly more of a personal preference, but it can be quite practical. Now, starting with the historic stuff, there are historic or abandoned railways all across the country. Within the UK, a lot of railways closed as roads and motor vehicle uh, vehicles became the more common way of transporting goods and people. Now, some of the lines have reopened either in part or in full following a period of closure. Such reopenings have taken the form of independent preserved heritage railways and of expansion to state-backed national rail and local uh, rapid transit or light rail networks. Most of these lines have converted to cycleways, footpaths, or highways. Now, what you see on the screen is the Rothbury Railway. Now, the people of Rothbury saw the advantage of having a railway connection. The district had been, long been the center uh, for the production of lime, uh, important in improving acidic soil for agricultural purposes, and Morpeth was a center of demand for the, the mineral. It was natural to consider making a railway branch line from the uh, from Rothbury to Morpeth, which was on the Newcastle and Berwick main line. Now, increasingly efficient road transport caused a collapse of the passenger and goods traffic and closure was pretty much inevitable. The last passenger trains ran on the 13th of September in 1952. A basic weekly goods service continued 
but on the 9th of November 1963, the Rothbury line was closed completely. Um, so again, this is just an example of some of the historic, these sort of smaller historical railways that people may or may not know about. And in some cases, they are in, in quite built up areas. Here's another example, which is the uh, the Gosport to Fareham railway line. So the term terminus was actually built after considerable negotiation with the Board of Ordnance, which argued that the site just outside a main gate in the Gosport lines ramparts could compromise the Portsmouth Harbour defences. The buildings were consequently designed to be defensible with surrounding railings and a roof parapet. Now, Queen Victoria requested that a 600 yard extension was, was created into uh, Royal Clarence Yard so that she and her guests could make use of the new station before heading across to the Solent, uh, to the island estate. And after Queen Victoria died on the Isle of Wight in January of 1901, her body was actually transported from Osborne to the Royal Station before continuing on its last journey back uh, to London. It was actually, this, this railway was actually then opened to the public for over 50 years. Uh, in 1953, passenger services from Gosport stopped, but freight traffic remained until 1969 when the station was actually uh, closed for good. And after being closed, the station building lay derelict for actually a number of decades falling into disrepair in the process. Now, the train shed of Gosport Station, the platforms and the buildings have now been converted into a small number of residential properties and offices with the main gate in Spring Garden Lane opened up for vehicle access. Now, why is this important? I mean, is it uh, when you get a lot of developments like this on old railway lines, there are contamination concerns, uh, depending on the type of um, you know, how old that railway line is, what the cuttings were filled with, et cetera, et cetera. So again, those are things to take into consideration if you are in and around old historic uh, infrastructure like this. Um, you also have the concerns about old tunnels. So we actually include data on, on tunnels, which some of you may or may not have seen or heard of. Now, why would anyone want to know about historic railway tunnels and how is actually this going to affect properties potentially? Now, these on the screen that you see are the Williamson tunnels, and they're kind of a bit of a mystery. They're a series of extensive subterranean excavations of unknown purpose in the Edge Hill area of Liverpool, and they are thought to have been created under the direction of a tobacco merchant, uh, landowner and philanthropist Joseph Williamson between 1810 and 1840. And these tunnels predate historic mapping, and therefore, once Groundshore were made aware of them by a client, we researched their locations and they were added to our historical tunnels data set. Now, the purpose of the excavation has been subject to widespread speculation. People were wondering why he did this. I mean, the folklore basically said that he, he did this as a philanthropic, philanthropic exercise. And really, it was just to give people uh, jobs. Um, a more recent research done by academics at Edge Hill University had concluded that the tunnels were in fact the result of work by Williamson to restore ground levels after quarrying. Now most of the excavations are directly within a band of high quality sandstone and show clear signs of having been carried out using established quarrying techniques and they're designed to produce single large pieces of stone suitable for building use. So again historic railways and tunnels kind of to a degree go hand in hand and it's actually quite important for us to know where these are and why they're there. The more kind of interesting things about old disused railway lines and railway tunnels and the more extreme versions are things like collapses. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of historic data. Now, this also includes other light railways, trams, uh, old tunnels, things like vernaculars, et cetera, et cetera but also the abandoned railways and tunnels. So this example that you see on the screen shows a section of tunnels, um, which is actually part of the Liverpool overhead railway that collapsed. 11 houses in this instance were declared unsafe after the disused railway tunnel in Dingle collapsed. And this was back in July of 2012. A survey undertaken by Liverpool City Council could not confirm the cause of the collapse in the tunnel, which runs for about three quarters of a mile un under Dingle. And there are other stories of construction work accidentally drilling into railway tunnels, both active and old ones, which never really bodes well for anyone on, on or near, super near train lines uh, or the construction above it. So 
that's kind of why people tend to want to know and it's good for people to be aware of these old tunnels particularly when you're looking at property in areas where there's a lot of historical railway. Um, moving on to kind of more modern uh, times, uh, we're looking at HS2. So once operational, HS2 will serve over 25 stations connecting around 30 million people. And HS2 will significantly or want to significantly improve connectivity in the North and the Midlands and will also integrate into the existing networks serving stations into Scotland. Um, you know, they talk about a huge amount of job creation and also homes being built in and around the lines and the stations themselves. Now, most of the British Rail Network was built in the Victorian area and the fastest trains can only go up to about 200 kilometers an hour. So it's quite updated. However, um, high speed rail has arrived finally in the country with the first bit of it opening, which is high speed one, which is the channel tunnel. Um, and the trains run up to speeds of about 320 kilometers an hour. Uh, and this is basically what HS2 is going to hopefully achieve. Now, our train networks have been running pretty much close to capacity before the pandemic. Uh, unless the UK invests on really long trains, the UK really can't move as many people as efficiently as they can in other parts, as you can do in other parts of the world, um, as our trains are narrower and they can't be a particular size. So, you know, this is a huge updating um, and modernization exercise of our rail railway infrastructure. Um, we've put the objectives of what the project entails on the screen. I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of controversy. It's been in the news. We will talk about that um, later. There's talk about making things more efficient. There's talking about increase, increasing capacity. There are questions around who this project is actually going to benefit, and that's some of the controversy. But let's take a closer look at the route, which is, tends to be what people tend are more interested in. So this is the current route for HS2. So phase one runs from London to Birmingham and is the dark blue section of this map. And this is currently under construction. Then you've got phase 2A, which is the light blue area, which runs from the West Midlands to Crewe. Uh, this was given the green light already. And then 2B, which runs from Crewe to Manchester and the West Midlands to Leeds. I will talk about what's been in the news recently about the Leeds part of HS2 in a bit. Uh, and then what's appeared now on the screen is the wider blue network would further connect Leeds to Newcastle and Crewe to Edinburgh. And then when you look at the stations, that is where the stations are. So you're talking about 25 stations, as I mentioned earlier, connecting around 30 million people. So that's almost half the population. So a significant piece of, of work. Now the HS2 phase one will, or quote unquote, is hoping to be open between 2029 and 2033 and run from London to Birmingham over 134 miles through 31 miles of tunnels and over 10 miles of viaducts, delivering quicker journeys on more trains with more seats from London to Birmingham. At least that is the dream. Um, then you've got phase 2A, uh, which is 58 kilometers or 36 miles, which will enable towns and cities across the Northwest of England, North Wales and Scotland to benefit. Um, Phase 2A is going to run from the northern end of phase 1A, or sorry, phase 1 at Fradley in the West Midlands to Crewe in Cheshire. And the services will then join existing rail network to, to create direct services to places including Liverpool, Manchester, Preston, Carlisle and Glasgow. And Crewe is also the station for connections to North Wales and Shrewsbury. Um, so this has gotten the green light. So work is going to start to go ahead for this part of it. What is kind of a little bit more uncertain is this part of the route, which is phase 2B, um, because the eastern leg was not included in the Chancellor's budget last month. Now, the government has accepted that plans for HS2 and other major schemes need to be brought together in an integrated rail plan for the North and the Midlands, and has said that it will set out the form, scope, and phasing of the phase 2B route across the western and eastern legs. Now, Again, there was a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, earlier this year, Boris Johnson mentioned something called the Northern Powerhouse Rail, which again, I will cover in the next couple of slides. Um, 
which is going to hopefully provide a high speed train service for Liverpool and will connect two branches of HS2. But again, this is all up in the air and I'm sorry I can't provide, I don't really want to speak in certainty or, or because at this point, nothing is actually quite certain for this section of HS2. Um, it's certainly been controversial. Uh, and like I said earlier, you know, this wasn't discussed in the budget. Um, so whether or not it's going to happen, I don't know. Now, the government refused. So as of yesterday, when I was having a look around, the government had refused to confirm or deny reports that it was going to cancel plans for the HS2 link to Leeds. There was a leak in the paper, apparently. And so it looks like they're going to cancel it and instead fund a sort of mishmash of disparate projects, uh, which favor conservative constituencies. Again, this is all opinion, and it kind of leaves mysterious gaps in the railway network. Grant Shapps is actually supposed to make an announcement tomorrow, tomorrow Thursday, regarding this. Um, the media suggested that they were going to commit building HS2 from Birmingham to Manchester, but not necessarily Leeds. Um, so this is not great. Uh, this is throwing all sorts of people into a kerfuffle because there's been so much talk in the last year of this Northern powerhouse rail and the connecting the two bits. So I would say keep your eye out in the news because this could throw these route changes and cancellations could be good news for some and bad news for others. It really depends. Um, you know, if it's anything like cross rail, you know, developers were already buying big tracts of land along the proposed routes to develop. Um, as you can imagine, that is a huge excitement for developers, you know, because you can build and sell more houses along these railway networks. Um, it's certainly something to keep uh, an eye out on. Um, and under the current plans as well, trains would run on to, you know, benefit wider networks, wider areas of the country, Scottish cities, current on the current railway lines and the east and west coast main lines. Um, however, particularly in Scotland, recently there have been calls from Scotland um, for from Scotland to make sure that actually the railway networks are joining whatever um, is is being built for HS2. So again, this is all going to be up in the air as to how it's going to fit in with what is and isn't going to be built from an HS2 perspective, but worth keeping an eye out on that. Now, I mentioned a lot of controversy regarding HS2 particularly. Um, there's various reasons why. There's been a lot of protests. There's a huge question as to whether or not actually HS2 is going to benefit commuters. Um, the majority of users for HS2 aren't actually gonna be commuters, but tourists and other types of travel. HS2's own research indicates that they expect 70% of their passengers to be leisure passengers, as opposed to using it for business and travel and commuting. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if you're talking about efficiency and time, is it actually going to save a huge amount of time? It's actually going to save 36 minutes from Birmingham to London, um, because people can already commute from London to Birmingham in less than an hour and a quarter. Although it does mean that the commute from to and from Birmingham from London becomes less than an hour each way. Is it a huge, you know, is it is it huge enough amount of savings for that amount of money it's cost? That is the question. There's also people who have lost homes um, along the railway line. Almost 600 million pounds has been spent buying up property to make way for HS2 amidst, of course, the increasing costs that people have seen in the media. Um, the probably the most controversial is of Shimmer Estate. So the Shimmer Estate was a uh, housing development with 212 family homes in Mexborough and South Yorkshire. It was completed back in 2017. Residents uh, received news back in 2018 that 52 homes on that estate were set to be bulldozed, uh, along with eight on the nearby Doncaster Road, only after a few years of the development being completed to make way for HS2. Um, there's also questions about the loss of environment, uh, the you know environmental impacts, uh, loss of ancient woodland in areas that are being protected, and really, there is a question about who this is actually benefiting because is is it actually going to benefit the whole country or only certain parts of the country? Um, not to mention, it was ex it's extortionately expensive. 
the price for building HS2 has increased uh, exponentially. Um, 106 billion, more than three times what the original budget was. Um, so, you know, people aren't very happy. And there are, there's a lot of justification and people talk about why it's so difficult and why the budget's completely been blown out of proportion. Um, fast trains are expensive. We need more trains. We need a lot of them. Uh, there's a huge amount of risk and uncertainty when you're looking at these types of infrastructure, the property itself. Buying a property to build these t this type of major railway is, is not cheap. Uh, you even have to do things like move rivers. Um, so, and, and, and again, move environmental, you know, protected areas. Um, that all costs a lot of money, but it's not all terrible in the news. I'm not going to lie. Um, there is some good news, a huge amount of it. You know, good news and bad news from an environmental perspective. One of the bigger concerns was the threat to UK wildlife. There's been environmentalists like Chris, Chris Packham saying that high-speed rail projects like this lead to irreversible destruction of habitats and woodlands. Um, one of the more unique areas it may damage is the Attenborough Nature Reserve. So some of the figures released by HS2 say that it's going to either risk the loss of or significantly impact on five wild wildlife refuges, 33 sites of special scientific interest, 693 classified local wildlife sites. So, and the list goes on and on. So the other thing to make, to be aware is if you do have a client that lives near the route and is hoping to enjoy some of these, you know, wonders of nature and, and natural sites, um, if you're close enough to HS2, there may be an impact in terms of enjoyment because those sites may actually be affected. Uh, but it is not all terrible because there is also talk of rewilding the environment. So just to bear that in mind, it's not all doom and gloom. But again, you kind of have to take the good with the bad. You have to understand, uh, well, you don't have to, but people need to try and uh, understand the whole picture and it's not all destruction. Um, so in terms of the good and the bad, they are trying to balance it out. Um, they are trying to rewild and save certain parts of the country as well. Now, in terms of actual railway and HS2 data, so I mentioned earlier, you've seen this map before, we look at national railway lines across all of the country. We look at other light rail tramways, such as Croydon, the Croydon Tram Lake and other tramworks. Those are all included as well. Uh, we've got funiculars, we've got, um, you know, even other more obscure pieces of data for rail, but in terms of probably what people are more interested in, things like visibility data. So there's always a question we get asked by prospective home buyers, am I going to be able to see something like HS2? Um, this just allows people to gain a much better understanding on where HS2 and big infrastructure will be visible from so they can make a more informed decision. So this first image shows the area where you'll be able to see HS2 during construction, so a much bigger area. Um, and then as time goes by, it gets a bit smaller. So this shows where you'll be able to see HS2 after its first year of operation. And then the third image shows the area where you'll be able to see HS2 after its 15th year of operation, once all the planning and the plants and, and growth and vegetation has been established. Um, we're the only provider currently to include this data within our searches. Now, this visibility data is only available for phase one and two A of the scheme. Of course, phase two B st still being consulted on, which is why we don't have that information. Um, what else do we look at? Well, in terms of HS2, but also other railway, we include maps of the nearest point of HS2 if it's been identified in a report and it gives you further information on the points that you see on the screen. So this is an example of the HS2 data that you would be included in our report. So you can see the property that is in question is outlined in red and we provide information uh, on the points you see on the screen. Now, things like noise assessments represent sound from HS2 and are generally assessed up to one kilometer 
from HS2 in rural areas and up to 500 meters in urban areas. So in some cases, the assessed area may be greater or smaller than this, and this assessment doesn't take into account any existing background noise from railways, motorway, motorways, etc. So this modeled noise reading uh, for this for this site you can see is 24 uh, disciples. So we do include some of that information, noise assessment information as well uh, on certain phases of the development. Um, so like you say, you can see there, you've got the property, you've got the different colored lines. You do get a key to explain what those colors mean. Um, it could be a safeguarding area. It could be the homeowner payment zones, one to three. It could be subsurface and surface safeguarding. Um, so you'll get all of that information as well. So probably a more specific example. So this second image is actually of a particular uh, brewery or brewing company, which is in one of the trading estates near an HS2 railway station. You can see it's surrounded by the purple marked area, which is the HS2 surface safeguarding. So the area around it has been earmarked for, H for the HS2 project. Um, whereas anyone that falls into the area isn't in a great position. We'll talk about safeguarding in a bit, um, but as you can imagine, if you are surrounded by that purple, there's gonna be plenty of disruption and upheaval around, around this area for year, years to come as the project progresses. Now, buying a property uh, near to a major railway project like this has its benefits. The obvious ones being it'll increase better transport links, potentially even increase property value. Um, but what should people be cautious of? So for all major projects like this, land is required for the scheme, not only for where the scheme will go, but also construction areas around the said scheme. So the government can also issue compulsory purchase orders for homes and businesses, business premises close to such schemes. So how does safeguarding actually work? Safeguarding requires local planning authorities to consult well, you know, with various organizations, when they are considering planning applications within the area that, that has been safeguarded. So we would then advise the local planning authority how to respond to the application. So not we, but the organization like TFL and other local authority organizations. In most cases, um, or in some cases, they'll have to ask for approval uh, to see whether or not, you know, it's going to conflict with the project. Now, you can also have something called statutory blight, which can also be triggered. So this term is used to describe a situation where a property is blighted in a legal sense, such as where it is in a development plan or within land safeguarding for a specific purpose. For example, the railway or included within a compulsory, compulsory purchase order. Um, so one thing we will always notify you of in our reports and in the data is whether or not the property falls within or is close to a safeguarding area. And like I say, safeguarding sounds like a nice thing, but actually it's not necessarily a good thing. Don't be fooled because it means it's there to protect the infrastructure, not the proper, you know, not the residential property. Um, it's not going to protect your client's house from any future development. Uh, it's, it's there to protect the actual railway infrastructure from future development, which means if you happen to be in or near a safeguarding area, you probably do not want to be there. Um, if you fall outside of it, great, but if you're close enough to it, it still may cause some type of disruption to a property uh, over time. So it's not ideal um, to be within a safeguarding area. So just make sure that your clients are aware of that if they are. Um, what else do we show you, let's say, if it's not HS2? So here's an excerpt from our reports uh, for the other parts of railway infrastructure that we look at. So active railways, active tunnels, historic railways and tunnels, the abandoned railways, tube stations, uh, underground lines. So that's all included as well. Uh, you'll get told how close you are, what the, the closest point to track and, and for HS2, the, the speeds that the track's going to run at. Um, if you're looking at, let's say, uh, not HS2, but other railways, you'll be told how close you are, uh, what the closest station are, if stations are, if you're in London, that would be hours of operation as well, um, because you have things like the night tube that go on. So it is really just there, 
is it a showstopper? No, absolutely not from a property transaction perspective, but it is good for people to be aware of where this stuff is and how uh, how close it is. So all of the things I've just talked about, historic railways, tunnels, active railways, et cetera, et cetera, HS2, cross rail one and two, all of that is already included on in the home buyer's report under transportation, like you see on the front page, um, or in the a Vista report. That is also included under infrastructure. Um, so it really just depends on whether or not you want a combined enviro and like rail transportation infra infrastructure or not. You can also buy a standalone energy and transportation report if you've already obtained an environmental report that doesn't include that information and you just want a standalone one. Um, so that is also available. It really just depends on what your requirements are um, and what your clients do and don't want to know about. In terms of recommendations, I think they're fairly, um, fairly commonsensical. So as an example for HS2, it's going to uh, recommend that you either contact HS2 directly um, to get more information from them. We'll give you information of who you need to speak to. If the property is within a safeguarding or compensation area, then that needs to be fully investigated in terms of the implication uh, of, of what buying a property within these areas means. If you're living near depot lines, um, operational noise could be disruptive. We always tell people if you're living near a railway, you need to make sure that you go and visit the property at different times of the day to understand what the noise pollution will be like, but also even potentially, you know, vibration, uh, how that can impact if you are in areas like London or if there's underground um, railway lines and what type of vibration you may get at different times of the day, particularly if there's lots of trains running, et cetera, et cetera. So we try and give as much practical guidance and information as possible. We'll always tell you who you can contact. And of course, as always, if you decide that you want to speak to one of our consultants or speak to somebody about this, you can always pick up the phone and speak to us or get your client to pick up the phone and speak to us and we can at least provide them guidance. So that is pretty much it for the session. Nice and quick today. If you've got any questions at all, please feel free to let us know. I hope it was useful. Um, if you'd like any more information regarding our reports or, or the data, again, within our reports, do uh, reach out to us. Um, and that is pretty much it. So thanks for joining us. And a quick feedback survey is going to launch after this. And we'd really like it if you could take a couple of seconds to answer uh, those questions. So thanks very much and have a great rest of the afternoon.